Welcome to Zero Point Reviews with Jeff and Kev, where no point is irrelevant, no point can't be turned or leveraged, and there's absolutely no point not to review these movies. This is Zero Point Reviews, and this week we're talking Sam Raimi's first year superhero movie, Darkman from 1990. Kevin, you ever this? You ever see this crazy ass movie in the theaters? Or in, why is this Sam Raimi's most underrated flick of all time? Ah. Uh... Golly, I missed it in the theater. I don't know why. Like, Army of Darkness, I was totally there with my dad. This I missed. This I saw when it hit VHS, I think, with my friend Wes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Like, he was my buddy that I would always go, like, watch horror films with. All right, Wes. Woo! <laughs> yeah, this is one of them where I was kind of like, I really like this movie. It's cool as hell. Yeah, it's pretty dope. It's pretty dark, actually, considering Batman came out like the year before. So Sam Raimi had a hell of a follow-up to do, and a lot of people do tend to remember this movie, but not a lot of people like swarm behind this movie as like a great follow-up to say like Batman. So like the superhero craze was a bit not quite there yet for Sam Raimi until he got to Spider-Man a few years later. Yeah, and that was extremely unfortunate because no one was willing to give him a chance. Yeah, he tried to get this shadow and universe. For some reason, he wasn't able to acquire the rights to it. And this was his answer to then doing it, which oddly enough, this is a universal movie. And later on, the 1994 flick with Russell Mulcahy and Alec Baldwin is also by Universal. Oh, is it? Yes, it is. I guess so I should under, have looked. So under the same distribution deal, whether they are actually assisting in production on it or not, I don't know. Oh. Hmm. I don't know. But uh, now he got passed over in between that time for, uh, um, what was it, Batman 3? Was that Batman Something. Forever? He wanted to do Batman or The Shadow, and he couldn't get quite either of them. Now, as far as like Batman Forever goes, it's a little too bad that Sam didn't quite get that one. I think he would have made Batman Forever a little bit better. Better. Not that I didn't like Val Kilmer or Tommy Lee Jones as, say, Harvey Dent, but I did not like somebody as the Riddler. Sorry, Jim. You weren't good enough for that role, in my opinion. He, uh, he was poorly directed. Poorly directed. That's all that was. And then we got Batman and Robin, and we all saw what happened with that one. Freeze. <laughs> that son of a bitch. Chill. <laughs> At least but I was what? defeated by love, not thrown out the window like a stupid bird. That can't fly. Bird man, fly, <laughs> chicken bitch. You know, the funny thing about that is, is there's like never a bad time or you're never unhappy to see Schwarzenegger and DeVito together. I don't know why. Like, I'm not a big fan of the movie Twins, but I do love seeing them together. I would love to see something like that for this kind of movie with like Dark Man. Unfortunately, Larry Drake is no longer with us. Rest in peace, good sir. But it would have been super dope to have some sort of some sort of reference to this from Liam at any point during any sort of award ceremony and be like, I'm everywhere and I am everyone. I am your award winner. Woohoo. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank the man upstairs. God, no, Mr. Jenkins. He, no. Um, sorry. <laughs> well, this movie did <laughs> prove that Liam could easily handle an action role. I don't remember many action movies before this with him, but then years later he would get into more of the action role with like the Taken franchise and like all these other movies he's doing these days. It was largely more of, from what I remember, he was more of a drama actor and he brought a certain gravitas to, you know, Peyton Westlake. And I really liked it because he also treated it like it was a stage play on a grand scale. 
like you felt the uh, the vibes of like phantom of the opera like all the time but it also had a grittiness to it and like an evilness to it and i felt like that really played into a duplicitous character that he just nailed to a t and this was the first time i ever noticed him and i'm like uh liam is dope as an actor and then you watch something like say the phantom Men phantom menace or you watch like the haunting and you're like um where's the actor that i like he's he's not here has has he checked out he was cool in those movies those movies just happened to suck sorry george not sorry <laughs> i hated the haunting i still hate the haunting i like, don't scary mind movie it. Two was a better plot I don't mind the haunting, but that'll be for a different zero point down the road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already zero point because I'm thinking of Catherine Zeta Jones. Um, Ooh, so, Catherine so, Zeta. Let me take my. Uh, you mentioned oh. Larry Drake bringing the gravitas. Well, you said <laughs> <laughs> Liam brings the gravitas to Peyton. Larry Drake brought savageness and like almost like a viper a cold staring viper to direct oh, yeah. and i love his whole team here like being surrounded like six guys surrounded by 60 guys and they're not afraid at all oh no and these I, guys are fucking nuts yeah and <laughs> of course danny uh danny hicks only has one leg and the other leg is this amazing Uzi <laughs> that they just destroy everyone. That throws me with. every time I watch this fucking movie because I never expect that to begin with. And I should remember that because it's a very memorable scene. It's like these guys show up. They got like no fucking guns on them. They're so completely surrounded. Oh, hey, let me just take my buddy's leg off and start shooting fuckers up. I mean, it was smart as hell. I thought it was funny. I mean, I thought it was cool. <laughs> um, but it's just amazing that, like, with that Uzi, they took out everybody else, enough people up close to get like the other five guys their guns. Just five guys. <laughs> there's like cars flying out of. Well, yeah, like the rest of Durant's team. I don't think where are the fries and the burgers there. with that, then, man. Son of a bitch! I wasn't gonna go there. I wasn't gonna fall for your pun. <laughs> Hey, proudly not sponsored by five guys proudly <laughs> <laughs> no but the the bad guys were all pretty perfect in this like yeah i don't know who was supposed to be cast for this who was supposed to be cast for for that but this was a happy accident however the cards felt like it was just a bunch of amazing bad guys and of course you've got ted in there <laughs> theodore <laughs> Ted's just the best in anything that he's in. That's just, that's generally the way it goes. Yeah, he was just missing Alvin and Simon. So it was a little too bad. But, you know, when Shemp's got a Shemp, you got to Shemp it along. Son of a bitch. That's for our evil dead fans out there. <laughs> no, I've got Alvin and the chipmunks in my fucking head still, you dick. <laughs> Alvin, Simon, Theodore, dude, dude, did it, did it. There's a special place in hell for you. Monetized. <laughs> Son of a gun. Got to get um, us monetized if you want to keep me singing, everybody. I suck. Yeah, right. What? When you talked about Raimi would have made a better Batman movie than Schumacher, I wholeheartedly agree because, like, Raimi didn't need to go back and look anything up to make a comic book movie. He just naturally did so. Well, he was a fan to begin with. It's not like yeah. he grew up and he never read a comic book. And he's like, I got this idea for a comic book hero. That's not how this works. If you yeah. want to write and direct a Star Wars movie, maybe you should actually like the Star Wars franchise. It applies to like superhero work as well. If you want to write and direct a superhero movie, I hope you're a fucking fan of some sort of superhero. If you're not, get the fuck out you don't know what you should be doing then at that point stick to what you know stick to what you love it'll come through in the finished product 
does damn so here because he was a fan of the Shadow Radio serials and he was a fan of the Batman comic books. It's very well known. Absolutely. And and I want to I, I clown him for it, but not the source that he went to. Schumacher that we talked about went to the trial of not sorry, uh well maybe he did go to trial of the tri trial of the trickster. Um went to the episode of the flash with Mark Hamill and like oh. it was the zaniest episode that they could possibly do. They just threw everything at the wall and he's like, okay, so that's what this movie needs to be. And no, like it didn't need the glowing lights, the black lights that were so popular at the time or the Batmobile doing hydros and shit. Like the this, ride. <laughs> This type of angle that Sam does where he kind of like does the Dutch angle and then zooms up and then has that horrid light there to make him look even more sinister. That's a good signature of a fucking comic book movie that Schumacher never had ever. Well, and that's almost a signature of Sam Raimi in general. He oh, loves yes. to do that kind of thing. Yes. And it's so effective and it's comforting when you see it. You're kind of like, it's a Sam Raimi movie. Well, he did it in also, like, Doctor Strange and whatever the hell that movie was. The Multiverse of Madness? The Ma in the Madden Multiverse of Madness, yeah. I was making a joke, everybody. The giant retconning? Yep. And trying to finish up somebody else's uh, directorial duties. Wait, wait, wait. What? What happened there? Sam, he came in last minute to fix that movie. He wasn't I... the director from the word go. He wasn't the original director for... Doctor Strange. Lame! But Ugh. he did what he could and he was able to get uh, get some certain elements in there that were necessary. I like I mean, the horror aspects he brought to it. I wish he had full reign on it, though. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, he truly gave Elizabeth Olsen something to chew on that she enjoyed, I think. Yeah, she blowing wanted... people's fucking heads off. Just the horror aspect of it, the mom aspect of it, like, he gave her character so much more to do than what, uh, what's his dink ass name? Uh, the misogynist Buffy's uh, creator, uh, Joss Whedon. Whedon. Joss Whedon. Yeah. Anyway. The other one who shall not be named, <laughs> but we name him anyway. Is not as bad as Washington. We, <laughs> <laughs> well, with Joss, he, he's just known as like an asshole director. Boy, newsflash to Hollywood. Have you ever met Hitchcock or Stanley Kubrick? Like, Jesus Christ. Every director's an asshole, but they have to be because they're working with prima donnas and they have to fucking get their vision out and make the studio happy and make money all at the same time. So it's like they, they can't take any shit. Well, and there's also good directors like Sam Raimi, who I've never heard one bad word about him as a director. No. Unfortunately, he's dealt with stupid shit most of his career, and I wish he had gotten more credit for the great director that he is. Yeah. Yeah, because he's... It, it's like Steve said last night. There's no movie that he's directed that you're going to be unhappy watching. Absolutely like, not. I think my favorite of his that's like has nothing to do with Bruce is probably the gift. And that was a sleeper. Like nobody really knew about it. And I fell in love with it instantly. Like that's a very good movie. And I usually cite the example of for love of the game starring Kevin Costner directed by Sam Raimi, a baseball drama movie. And that's a fantastic movie in and of itself. As a baseball movie, it's it's fine. But as a drama centered around baseball, it's excellent. Kevin Costner actually does not phone in his performance in that one. Actually, it looks like he came to work that day. And it <laughs> looks like he respected Sam enough to be able to work that kind of level with him. And that movie is very underrated. It didn't perform at the box office. Not many people even like remember that fucking movie these days. But Sam has proven time and time again, he can direct just about the hell out of anything you throw at him. And it's usually at least going to be good to fantastic. And Doctor Strange, I'm going to call that a good movie by comparison to everything else we've had out of Marvel in Phase 4. 
Yeah. No, that's got its own problems, but I don't think he wanted that, but he was, that's what he was thrown into. No, I mean, my biggest issue with it, and I'm sorry, folks, I know it's a zero point, is they changed Wanda too much at the end to make her uh, irredeemable. And that just did, went, completely went against what happened in WandaVision. But he didn't know that because they wouldn't let him know what the fuck happened in WandaVision. Right. Well, and Doctor Strange was a secondary ca- character in his own sequel. Yes. Yes, he was. So, yeah. I don't know. Just give Sam Raimi the keys to the shadow. Batman. Spider-Man 4. Dark Man again. Let's get that career going. Come on, Sam. We know you want to do some work. <laughs> Pizza Papa needs his own goddamn movie. Um, that would be I'm, so dope, dude. <laughs> there are rumors about... I want him to be Mephisto, but... Ooh, that would be fun. That would be really That would fun. be really good. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah, because... But really at no- least Bruce shows up at the end of this movie. Yes. Did I actually get the picture of that? No. Credited as the final Shemp. So all you Evil Dead fans will at least get a kick out of that little Easter egg in the credits. Even though he says no words, he still gets a credit. That's true. That's true. Not his own name it even, but, you know. We saw. We knew it was him. It, it, it wasn't Billy. It would have been funny if he would have just called him Ash Williams. Ash Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so stupid having to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great. That was. That's what happened when I met him. Oh, Nobody I, else... I know. He didn't. Anyway, yeah. I'm digressing a lot again. Let's get back to Darkman because this is a fantastic film. Yeah, we're just loving on Sam for a minute. It's okay, everybody. We're getting to the movie now. Sorry, kids. No, you're not. Um, I'm not. This I really loved. This connected with me because uh, it's it's a movie about like rage and just pure violence, and it had a poetry to it at the same time. So it's like both sides of my duality were really appeased with this movie. Like it had the moments where like he bends the guy's finger backwards, and the guys inside of me are going like, yeah. Um, it was amazing, but then you get poetic moments from him where it's like he realizes that his hands are gone, and then he sees his face, and you just hear this like blood chilling moan and cry from him that sounds yep. so sincere, and you're like, Ooh, it gives you the willies. It's guttural and primal all at the same time. It's like, yeah, man, where the hell did this come from, Liam? Holy shit! Yeah, and. And then it's a silly movie again. But it's like there's so much humanity that they bring to this film, even though it's in this insane world. Yeah, for as wild as the film is, it's very well balanced. It goes between horror to sadness to drama, back to horror to fantastical, back to drama, back to horror. Okay, we'll do a little goofy for a minute. (laughs) And then we're going to fucking blow blow everything up and go really nuts. (laughs) For as frantic as that sounds, there's a melody to it. It feels like you're listening to a classical song, and it's just building. Then it then it levels out. Then it builds up again. Then it levels out, and then it goes straight up to the root. It's like it's well constructed as a story. There's a clear first, second, and third act, and you get the prologue. You get the the beginning, the middle, and the end. It's very well constructed edited written and it just it comes together so smoothly my big problem is is i don't know why i don't watch this movie more often i feel like i don't want to watch this movie too much because it i don't want it to degrade its legacy in my mind somehow i just want to enjoy this like whenever i'm in the mood to watch this i just want to fire it up and be like i'm solely focused on it i don't want it to be like a like say Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and I put it on. I pay attention for ten minutes, then I go run around doing errands around the house and just listen for particular scenes. Yeah. Whenever this is on, I want to make this special for me to watch because it's so good. The 
acting is incredible. Um, I won't say that about the love interest. I don't think she's all that great, to be frank with you. And but Larry Drake, Liam Neeson, just about everybody else on the cast seems to bring their A game. Even the douchebag Dick, as the head of the you know the corporation. I, I forgot his name. I didn't write it fucking down. But like, Strack. He's a great like RoboCop dick villain, you know, like the old man from like OCP. He's perfect, but he's not an old dude. He's this middle-aged guy who is like on the move up to be that level. And it's great. There's so many parallels between this and RoboCop and like Batman and other movies that it doesn't feel like it's totally ripping it off. It feels like we're going to pull this in, but we're going to do it our way. So we're going to put our yeah. own stamp of approval on this. And that's what I like about homages. It's not a ripoff. It's an homage. They, we took an inspiration. We're going with it. That's right. They did it their way with blackjack and hookers. <laughs> but what about the cocaine, Kevin? The cocaine. Speaking of this. It's a hell of a drug. <laughs> oh, um, you, you mentioned the special effects, and that was the blue screen, the blue screen of death that we were talking about yesterday. And I yeah. thought you were talking about this scene here. No. This, I love this so much. It reminded me so much of Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness. But I love oh, the yeah. fact that you see, like, there's an inch space between what you think is his hand and the actual burnt flesh. <laughs> and it's just, it's so cool looking. Well, they used like a good, like, stop motion sort of thing going on. But my big problem with some of the special effects was. There was a lot of unnecessary special effect shots with the blue screen. There's there's at least two examples. I didn't clip anything. I didn't do any videos. I like this movie too much. I didn't feel like it was totally necessary except for take the fucking elephant. But um, <laughs> and Kevin will get to the, There we go. Where, when he was the elephant for. But like there's scenes where a window is blowing open against a storm background. And I'm thinking, why the fuck are you doing a blue screen on this? Because your next scene is literally in an alley where it's raining. You easily could have done the same shot from inside one of those other windows, having one of those windows be a double pane that swings out. You easily could have thrown those out. The water was already coming down in an alley. You could have gotten the same damn shot. I'm just saying. Kind of. And then there's other shots that are very similar, and it's like, you didn't well and another one is like francis at the cemetery she's standing and her back is against a blue screen and they got the cemetery behind her and literally when they make the next cut it's her at the cemetery without a blue screen yeah it's like did you do a pickup shot why did you need that you didn't need that like at all so i feel like there was a bit of unnecessary blue screen going on i'm not sure why sam's not usually doing like excessive things like that so i really it kind of threw me off this time watching it because it's been a while since i've seen this movie so i'm like looking at this with more of a critical eye this time than i ever have before because we're doing a review for it and i don't know i just felt like some of the blue screen stuff i mean for the most part, the blue, blue screen stuff is pretty good. But there's times where it's like, why did you even do that? You could have saved yourself a few bucks and not even done it and done it practically. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Tell me if I'm say, seeing something wrong, everybody. Put a comment below. I'm not following with some of these things. Like, if you needed a particular shot, I guess. But if she was at the cemetery in the one shot, why would you have a blue screen behind her? I don't know. Just the saying. Best, my best guess would be reshoots. Or pickup I, shots or something. But, like, I don't know. It, it was like, you, you didn't even need it. You could have just left it out. Because your next shot is her on a side angle looking at the at the coffin still in the cemetery. 
you didn't need to frame it like you were looking at her like face on with me and then the next scene you're looking at her like this at the cemetery and it's a real <laughs> shot i don't know that just didn't make any sense to me so i don't know this is very early 90s late 80s yeah, i guess they were just trying to figure something out there or pick up shots re reshoots i don't know like you said well, apparently the editor had a nervous breakdown and quit so <laughs> I don't I don't know what the story behind that is or the validity to it, but apparently, yeah, the editor yeah. had so much going on pressure around this movie on him. I don't know that he had why. an actual it's breakdown. It's not like this was under play. a time frame or anything that I could tell. I don't know. I don't know if it was a time frame or if it was because they wanted it to be the next Batman. Um, because they actually mm. did do some marketing for this movie, which they typically hadn't done for stuff like this. Well, I remember the trailers on TV. It made this thing look fucking dope as hell. And yeah. I think when it came out, it was a little bit of a different and horrific movie than people were expecting. Oh, gosh. I, yeah, I think you're probably but I remember right. the commercials. They seem like this is going to be a cool-ass movie. Yeah, I mean, I was just blown away, but I've always been a Sam Raimi fan ever since I saw Army of Darkness. Same here. So it's like, even without knowing that he had done this movie, I just, oh, yeah. again, naturally loved it because I love his style of movie. And then I'm realizing, oh, okay, at the end, I see Bruce. Everything makes yeah. sense now. Bruce is in almost all of his movies and some sort of cameo. Same with Ted. Yeah, yeah. Ted had the best part in this movie. And it's Rick. one of the most... <laughs> Rick was amazing. He pushes him up through this manhole so fucking hard that the manhole cover pops like five feet up in the air and goes, clang! And he's just like bobbling him. goes the weasel. <laughs> now, I don't know how or many whack people all. home. Yeah, right? The, what are the little <laughs> things on fucking Mario 3 that are like the little um, <laughs> yeah. the moles that come up out of the ship and throw the wrenches? <laughs> Pretty <laughs> anyway, much. Yeah, like Ted had the best, most memorable death in this, I think. And I don't, I can't say it's the most memorable death in an action movie of the, of the 90s, but golly, it set the bar pretty high first thing because it, it, it was very much a prosthetic or a puppet, but Golly, they did a good job making it look like Ted, and they put the the screams so well that it, just, it looked cool. Best off-screen death I have ever seen. Kinda, yeah. And then the lead up to it, where he's you know drowning him, holding him up under the water, or waterboarding him basically, and he's screaming, "I told you all I know. Oh, I know. I know." But let's pretend you didn't. <laughs> well, I also like the the little subtle arc between, you know, Durant and Rick. There seemed to be some sort of like low key like father son relationship going on there. It was very interesting, but it never got like fully developed. So you really couldn't tell where it was gonna eventually go. If he was like, "Hey, you're gonna be my 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 number one." A guy. guy. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Um, because he's it shows him like booting up to him for shooting the assistant through the head. Oh, right through the brain, just the way I like it. I'm like, <clears throat> very clean. Uh, I'm very impressed. I see good yeah. things for you. And then when Rick is missing, like he asks about him like two or three times, and then it just kind of gets dropped. I don't remember them saying oh they found rick dead like broken in half or his face ran over which they could have shown that never to be seen ever again <laughs> goodbye ted we salute you mr number one henchman it's true god he was cool though i love ted and everything mr Danny hicks it's funny his death scene i wrote oh poor ted got run over by a semi <laughs> <laughs> i literally wrote that in my oh it's as stupid as that sounds it just popped into my head with the grandma got run over by a reindeer <laughs> 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 for some reason i thought that when i saw that scene 
Oh, poor dad got run over by a semi. <laughs> <laughs> and that was just so cool. Like you had to rewind it. I, I mean, I, yeah, I'm a little bit sadistic, but I rewound it several times as a kid, like just laughing because I thought it was so goddamn funny. Because Rick yep. had it coming. Like I wasn't being like, oh, look at the death. Oh, gross. Oh yeah. No, it's just Rick Rich was had an it asshole. coming. Yeah. Yeah, I loved the the swift, savage, and poetic justice of it. Yeah. Almost all the deaths were really good in the movie, actually. Um, yeah, and <laughs> the callback, where is it? Where they have the elaborate scheme to have him blow up. Yes. And, <laughs> and it's a hologram. That was so cool. Uh, and they finally have things like that in real life. Like holograms weren't really there yet <laughs> in our society. But the movie made it look pretty damn good back then. I, I remember yeah. this in the theater because I did see this in the theater opening, opening weekend. I did snuck you? the fuck into this movie. <laughs> I did not pay a ticket for this movie. I snuck into this shit. And when we were that age, yeah, you found your way in to see these movies if you really wanted to see one. Nothing would stop you. And I remember, like, when he went to go swipe at the, the stupid little duck bobbing up and down for the lighter, everybody in the theater just went, oh, shit. <laughs> the theater was packed. I was there at a packed theater in San Diego. And motherfuck, like everybody was just going crazy for that particular moment in the movie. They're like, yeah, motherfucker. And oh, shit. Because <laughs> you it knew was what cool. was going to be coming next is a big explosion. But yet there was still another couple of seconds. So let the audience like breathe in that particular moment. And it was just really exhilarating and fun. Like that last third of the movie is so freaking tight and awesome. It's incredibly well edited, so I don't know if it was the same editor or a different one, but whatever was going on, the last like 20 minutes of this movie was just flat out, balls out awesome. Yeah, and, and in a way, without the seriousness of it in a way, uh, like the, the revenge sequences were a lot like The Crow. Yes. Or, or the, the house cleaning sequence at the end of Godfather. And it was just really, like you said, really tight and concise. And they progressively got worse. And each person's death was like something horrific. The the extra breath. Uh, Durant thinking that he's that uh, he's got him with the, the thump gun shooting down. Not realizing that he's stuck to this truck and about to fly into an overpass. Yep. <sighs> it was glorious. Kind of. I accepted the blue screen there. That was okay. It needed to be. Yeah, that was perfectly fine by me. The The one little thing out of that whole sequence that wasn't probably necessary was a piece of the helicopter flying past uh, <laughs> Westlake and Darkman in, in a horrible case of CGI. You didn't need that to fly right by them. That, that was just not necessary. You could have saved yourself a few bucks with that one. Fair enough. And the fireball was quite enough. The fireball and was fucking crazy it was great watching that scene now like it, it's not lessened for me in any way but you look at the thump gun that he's using you're just like are those kotex rolls like that they're not even toilet paper size <laughs> like right I'm fairly fairly certain that's not really a machine or a, a grenade launcher but I love it just the same. <laughs> hey, as long as it packs up punch and takes the fucker out, who cares? That's true. And God, I would have loved to have seen like a back shot from the scene with the cars like dodging the explosions, the cars getting hit by the explosions. It would have been like a really awesome version of say like the Matrix merged with the Blues Brothers. Yeah, that that would have been pretty interesting too to get a little more frantic action, frantic action going on but it felt like they were paying attention to their budget but also pr maximizing what they could do with what they had and at that time i don't think anybody's paychecks were too high 
uh, maybe Larry Drake, but it, he would have been well worth it in my opinion because he was he's great as Durant. I know he's technically the number two villain, but he ultimately becomes the main foil in the series overall because he comes back in one of the sequels. And he provides yes. a great recurring villain for Darkman himself. Yeah, and every superhero needs that. And I'm glad that they chose him for that instead of Me Strack. too. Yeah. Because Strack's not that interesting at all. He's, He's Stark with a Strack. Yes, he is. And uh, to you, to your point, he's uh, Stark mixed with the old man. He's actually wanting to build Delta City. And so Literally. Like, yeah. So, I mean, the, you you had the, the occurrences there <laughs> where he's his superpower is not being afraid of heights and being able Which to... Which is really through. funny. <laughs> yeah, being able to, like, jump from girder to girder without getting blown away by the fucking wind. <laughs> Strack jumps with the greatest of ease. He's the daring young rich man trying to shoot out your knees. Trying to shoot out your knees with a rivet gun. Yeah. <laughs> and he hits Kevin, him in the hand. I gotta say, it was the most riveting sequence in the whole movie. <laughs> gotcha. You've been waiting all day to say that, haven't you? You've been waiting two days to say that. <laughs> when he picks up the gun and he's like holding it like this all I can think of is whoa mama and somebody I thinks he's like, a badass <laughs> <laughs> but again, it would have been way more interesting in Robocop to be frank with you yes actually it would have it would have but it did it it did at least lead to a very cool sequence where Darkman's hand got put up against a, a steel girder with a rivet and he rips through it just to deck the bitch and throw his ass off. Yes, because once he gets that adrenaline surge, he feels nothing. Well, he and has like his pain receptors have been all severed in the movie. Yeah. They talk about that. And the fact that he he could just do that and just fucking knock him out. But dude, you're gonna need more bandages for that hand now, dude. <laughs> <laughs> This movie, I was waiting for for your explanation about anime films, like bandages fix everything. Like they do. The anime never came to this because he was just instantly cured. There were so many bandages, I'm guessing. But question regarding that, not anime, yes. but when he was in the hospital and the the doctor, the neurosurgeon, was giving the exposition basically of of his condition with the severed nerves the uh bipolar disorder basically and the, the testosterone surge mm -hmm. what, what the fuck was that spinning wheel that they had him on like they had him on, on a rack like he was da vinci's uh man or whatever it is but they had him spinning like they were gonna be throwing knives i was gonna say they're getting ready for knife practice yeah, or or like, some weird variation on the Married with Children early episode where, you know, how, what kind of torture are you going to put your spouse through? How many times are you going to spin the wheel to win a prize? Wasn't that a scene on uh, Stay Tuned where Jack Ritter yeah. got stuck to the wheel of fortune? <laughs> oh man, I love that movie Stay Tuned, but no. I, there's probably some scientific thing to keep like blood flow going or something like that. He was clearly hooked up to some sensors and some IVs. I don't know. Seemed kind of stupid to me, but it gave him a reason to burst out of like, you know, restraints and whatnot, instead of just being strapped to a, a typical sort of gurney or a bed or anything like that. It gave you something kind of unique and fresh to look at instead of the usual typical, you know, hospital scenes where they're usually i'm in a bed i can't get up at least i've got a halo there, he can throw an arm down and release his straps so yeah but golly like when she's given the exposition and she's calling him a vegetable and sticks him in the leg with her fucking pin i'm just like bitch like <laughs> dude she pokes him, she pokes him like seven times just to be like this is kind of fun Sorry, that was the bone. Let me try again. Like, it, yep, uh, he feels no pain. I'm just gonna poke him over here. Oh, and over here, and over here. 
Oh, and if I complete the pentagram on his body over here and over here. <laughs> Bitch, he's you're the, you did spirits. the voodoo that made him dark man. Voodoo's. I I really loved his powers though, like the getting pissed and destroying everything. Is I've loved that since I was a kid with the Hulk, so it it meshed really well with me. Don't make him angry because he's already volatile to begin with. True, true, and to the point where when he does go back to to see Julie and like trying to make sure oh. everything's okay again, like it was so saccharine that my teeth were rotting away. Like, stop. Stop being sweet, Peyton. It's not... Ugh. Peyton that part was fine. Working. Julie, as a character, just annoying bitch. Like, he proposes to her, and she's like, oh, I need to think about it. If she needs to think about it, she's not going to marry you. That should be a red flag, dude. What you doing hooking up with a chick who says, I need to think think about it i love you but i need to think about it if you need to think about it you've already not thought about marrying him that's true that's true and they were living in his loft she's a lawyer to his point well she was a journalist wasn't she or was she a lawyer she was a lawyer for that firm okay. and and they went with the the trading places plot line yeah where they were leaking funds out to durant i don't I have think. a dollar to bet you fucker <laughs> i got a bottle cap butterbeer bottle cap oh that works uh, yeah one cap there you are uh, i just totally lost myself with the bet trading places you're talking about julie yeah julie she she leaves the memorandum the evidence yeah at his house not good enough to marry him but you're good enough to leave his fucking death certificate at his house. People are morons. Kind of, yes. And then she figures it out after she's been dating the fucking guy who very clearly fucking set the whole thing up. Yep. He comforted me. Fuck off, whore. <laughs> <laughs> but it, nothing serious. I just kind of slept with him about three dozen times, but it doesn't mean anything to me. I the love you. Said. Tell me what's wrong with you. I need to help you. But yeah, I, well, I might be horribly disfigured. Would you still love me? And she's like, I don't know. How disfigured are you? And I'm like, oh my fucking God, girl, get the fuck out of his secret lair. <laughs> that whole scene... <laughs> I swear to God, as an adult, just pissed me off. I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck did I just see? Does she really like that? Like, holy god damn, dude. I, it deleted it, but I had a picture where he's reaching out for her when he first tries to come back. And he can't talk because his, his jaw is really not working yet. Yeah, the, it's me. Yeah, and he's trying to to call to her, saying it's me, and calling her name. And you got that part, like he was saying, Julie. She freaks out, screams right in his face, and then runs to her apartment. And I got a picture of him reaching out, and her, like, just, again, the freak out running. And I wanted to put underneath it, let's have a talk about tolerance, bitch. <laughs> like... You just thought it was somebody randomly asking for help, and you ran away because it was a poor, dirty person. Oh, shit. <laughs> That's what's wrong <laughs> with lawyers. Uh, don't get me started on lawyer jokes. I rib on it, but at the same time, you're just kind of like, yeah, yeah, come on now. And then Tim Story redid that scene in the Fantastic Four like 10 years later. 15 years later. Yep. Oh, well, I mean, they had to have constructed her character like this on purpose so they could give him more like uh, fodder for becoming the dark man and showing that he can't go back to his life because, she, sorry, bro, she's just not into you when you're kind of looking like that. Yeah. Like she wasn't into you when you were good looking. 
Well, and she was so on him about like your your research. You can make the face permanent, can't you? It's like, holy shit! You're an you are a very selfish woman. If you really loved him, you would support him regardless, no matter what. Kind of right. That's a comic it, fucking book storyline here. Don't worry, seconds. I'm not bagging on the writing. I'm just saying this is how the character came across, and they clearly did this on purpose. So. Oh, of course, of course. But the whole 99 seconds thing, golly. 99 minutes. I, Oh, 99 minutes. That's right. I'm sorry. Lynn is going to be on your ass, bitch. <laughs> Damn it. Um, it's for her special friend Lynn out there. She fact checks us sometimes. I don't want to be the asshole, but goddamn, every single Michael Jackson joke just like went <laughs> through my head when that nose dissolved. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, MJ. <laughs> you failed, MJ. I'm not going to listen to Thriller. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Jonathan Landis was one of the doctors that uh, was bandaging yeah. him up. I saw that. That was pretty funny. I didn't realize that until the credits rolled. And I'm like, oh, shit, that was him. Yeah. Oh, you can tell. Like, the side of his beard yeah. and his glasses. You're like, oh, I know who that is. And then well, I yeah, I'm like, raining. it kind of looks like Landis. And this is the first time in, like, I've ever seen this. I've seen this movie enough times. But I actually watched the credits. And I'm like, Jonathan Landis? And then how they credited Bruce Campbell as Final Shemp. And I'm like, shit, it was Jonathan Landis. And Final Shemp, Evil Dead reference. What the fuck? And it's then cool. there's Shimp's beer. They need to come out with a limited edition of Shimp's beer. Or cola, Shimp according to the video game. Right. Pink fuck. Still need to get that ketamine. The pink F, bro. Ghost <laughs> beaters for life. <laughs> Fode's got to talk to her today. Yes. Fantastic. And we had a great interview with her. So anybody checking this interview checking out our little review here we have an old interview on our podcast channel here um about a year and a half ago ish and she's a fantastic lady highly recommend going to check that out we talk about army of darkness evil dead and a few other things so please go back and check that out and despite what she says dana really is the coolest person on earth she really is and she hates it when i call her de lorenzo <laughs> or Dina Renzo. Jeff, what is that? Say my name, bitch. She's not Hispanic, dude. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but that's what she picked on me. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. Definitely I go know. back and check out our interview with Dana. She's fantastic and funny as hell. It's true. It's true. Um, I'm lost on Dark Man again just because we started talking about something so much better than Francis. Yeah, Francis is probably the only bad, re really bad part about this movie, but it felt like it was, like I had said, it felt like they did that on purpose so he could easily distance himself and go off on his own and do his own story. And off the top of my memory, I don't think that character actually comes back in the sequels, like, at all. Oh. And so it's more of a focus on him versus like Durant. And he, Liam does not come back to his credit. I don't know what the deal was, but the next movies were direct to video anyway. But Larry Drake comes back and he's fantastic and glorious as an evil counterpart to honored Arnold Vosloo, who plays the mummy in the mummy and the mummy returns movies. So that's who plays Darkman going forward. I think he does a pretty damn good job. And those movies are fun. They're just not clearly on the level of Dark Man, which I'd call this one of Sam's best movies outside of like the Evil Dead movies, of course. Yeah. And it's a good, fun movie that you don't hear many people talking about. And I feel like it deserves a lot more attention and credit. And it's out there. Screen Factory's got a wonderful Blu ray on here. The only problem I have with this Blu ray is not the content it's not anything like that it's the reversible cover art this commission oh. bullshit sucks 
I fucking <laughs> hate it. I I I don't give a shit if people like it. That's fine. That's your call. Art is subjective. Film is subjective. The reversible cover art on this is absolute shit. Fucking hate it. It's always movie poster for me because this movie poster is super iconic. That's what most of us are familiar with. And then there yeah. was a slip cover. There was a poster. I'm like, fuck that. I'm buying this off Amazon. I want to drop some price. But there's good interviews on here with Liam. They got the commentary with a director of photography. They got an interview with Larry Drake before he passed. So there's some really fun uh, material on here. So I highly recommend going to check this out. We have affiliate links for Amazon down below. If you do make that order, it does kick us back a few cents. We keep the lights on with that. So please do that if you're interested. The movie's fantastic. And it's a it's a favorite of mine. This will never leave my collection. I used to have the DVDs, used to have the VHS. Got rid of all those. I just, I'm keeping this Blu-ray in particular. I, what you got over there, Kevin? Uh, the old widescreen edition DVD. Ooh. Oh nothing special, nothing fancy. There's absolutely no special features to it. Uh, read the Jove book. The what the book? Jove. J-O-V-E. Hmm. I don't even see that on the back of this. I don't know, but hey, I love novelizations of movies from the 80s and 90s. Those were the best. They don't do that much. Also starring Colin Friels from Dark City. I'm going to have to look who the fuck that is. That's Uh, uh, Streck. He was in Dark City? I guess so. I'm a Dark City nut. I'm going to have to figure out who the fuck he was. Uh, Larry Drake. Oh, maybe he was Mr. Sleep. Okay. Um, Danny Hicks from Evil Dead 2 and Nicholas Worth from Swamp Thing. Was he in Swamp Thing? Wasn't he the ball guy? Take flight! I don't recall. The one that he throws off the fucking uh, uh, hovercraft, or the jet, the speeder. Let's see here. Uh, I don't know. I'm stuck. Riveting, on riveting stream here, Kevin. Thank you very much. I'm no, sorry. Look. Say something. Oh, I look this up. What Swamp Thing movie are you talking about? Yeah, I'm guessing it, the old. No, it's the original, and it's the guy who was told to take flight, who was going to run off with Rick after the money was stolen. He's That's the bald headed right. guy with a tattoo on the neck. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. That's yes. what I was saying, and then you got me confused, jackass. Sorry. Sorry. No, you're That's not. Right. It's fine. The one, the one that fucking figures out that uh, Mr. Arcane's not as nice as he yeah. Yep. And it's sitting right there, right there, right behind that camera still. I want to watch it now again. Right on. I love that movie. Um, did you notice who did the music on this movie? Uh, some, somebody from like an 80s new wave band. It sounded very 80s new wave. Let me see if I wrote it down. Or am I thinking of a different uh boingo something or other i didn't write it down i I actually think it was a different movie (laughs) this this wasn't the first time that that danny worked with uh uh, sam but i think this was probably the first time that he had as much fun with sam as he did like uh danny said that he really really enjoyed writing the music that yeah, flowed was, yeah. with this uh with the style of of sam's uh cinematography and it works so well together like yes he did the same type of stick for uh dick tracy but dick tracy didn't flow the same way that this movie flows together with his music yeah I, I just really liked Danny Elfman in general. And the fact that he was involved with like Batman and then also this he certainly had a little panache, so to speak, for doing uh, these dark movies, so to speak. And it, 
gave the movie an extra level of character that I absolutely adore and love. And it didn't feel like you were listening to Batman. It felt like you're listening to something very different, but also familiar at the same time. It sounded to me like the March of the Dead. Not the theme song from Army of Darkness, but right. where they're marching towards the castle. That's kind of a bit of what I got from it. And that's not a bad thing, because that was a right. really good scene and a real good t uh, tune. Tone. 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 It all fit. Like, the darkness, the grittiness. I don't mean to use a pun, but the... the just the feel of the movie, the it vibed so well. And Danny Elfman is a is a genius when it comes to scoring films. But this feels so much better than say the team up or the pairing of say Spider Man or Hulk. Right. I didn't feel Hulk specifically, I did not feel Danny's score. Spider Man, you did feel that, but it wasn't like it didn't feel as good as this or Batman even. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Because it's the funny, uh, really are powerful. Yeah, it really stands out with this movie. I, And they do kind of borrow it in this sequel, so it's not like it's completely lost, but it's also a bit understated at times. It just, it really gives the movie like an extra depth that I really enjoy. Speaking of borrowed, there are plenty of sound bites that are used in this when people get blown up or dropped or what have you that are all uh, Bruce Campbell screams from Evil Dead 2. <laughs> uh, it definitely feels like they tried to put Liam through the Evil Dead uh, initiation a little bit. A little bit, yes. <laughs> With the camera rising up in his face. and yep. they, didn't, they didn't really douse him in blood, though. No. He got rained on like a son of a bitch. Like That scene, yes. I felt horrible for him. Not just Peyton, but I felt horrible for Liam sitting down there. Like, oh, you poor boy, here comes the... <laughs> Here comes a little too much water for you to see if you can handle it. <laughs> it doesn't rain that hard in fucking Florida during hurricane season. Like, holy shit. <laughs> they were trying to drown him with the sprinkler system. <laughs> <laughs> and all he had was this piece of shit cardboard box for shelter that just like, all right, let it go. And it blows away. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah, I mean, it made you feel. It really did make you feel for him. But like yeah. the older I get, I'm like, oh god, poor Liam. Ooh, Peyton, sure, but Liam had to do that time and time and time again. Hey, Liam was always a very committed actor. He always put his all into every role, even if the roles didn't really suit his talents. All I could think of is fucking uh, Charlize Theron putting the daisy in his ass. <laughs> <laughs> and fucking million ways to die in the West. I've never seen that actually. <laughs> it's so good. Actually, most people do not like it. I thought it was really funny. Yeah. Be because it was great actors not taking themselves seriously. So it was very fun for me. Well, that's what a lot of people are pointing at for him to be able to take over the role of Frank in uh, the Naked Gun movie that he's going to be doing. Now, yeah. This far as like dark man where do you rank this in like a legacy for like sam and then do you think it would ever make good for a comeback um yes i i, I would think if sam was involved consulting in any way this would be fantastic there's plenty of room for dark man the story's wide open it it wasn't a saga or an epic movie that really you could reboot and fuck up i i guess you could but it, it's a very simple uh uh formula okay blah, blah, blah. it's a very simple formula that somebody yeah. could make a good movie with dark man again given the budget and the proper love of sam Raimi's uh style of directing and love of the original i would i wouldn't mind seeing that so Fidi Alvarez is going to direct Dark Man reboot in like the next three years. <laughs> Please. He's the only person I want to see reboot stuff anymore. It's like, I like his work. Yeah, we'll see how Alien Romulus turns out. After that, then I might be a little more on track with like, all right, Sam, you need to hire this guy again, buddy. Kind of, yeah. Um, I saw an article the other day after we did the, the trailer breakdown. And it said, and the title was, 
Fide Alvarez breaks down the Alien Romulus uh, trailer. I'm like, what's to fucking break down? It, it panned backwards and it went bah! at the very end. Yeah. That was it. That was all it needed to be, but break it down. Well, a lot of YouTubers did, including us. <laughs> we're not the directors. We were seeing it for the first time. This guy's explaining to people what they're seeing. Hey, if I knew how to direct and be a good director, I would totally do it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. That's why we have friends like Marty. Goddamn right. I mean, I've helped on in the indie films before, but I've never been a director, so I'm not one to talk. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Um, before, but before I, forget, I think they could remake this film. I think it would do well. It would really ultimately depend on the creatives and, and who they cast. But I do feel like this is almost perfect to put in the modern era right now. You don't have to change like too terribly much. There's still plenty of abandoned buildings you can put a Dr. Westlake into and doing uh, makeup prosthetics, things like that, blending in with people. Like, there's there's something that could still be pulled from today and make it sure. pretty, pretty badass. So I'd be totally down for it. Whether we see anything, who knows. But this was Sam's love letter to batman and the shadow and he gave us something unique amazing and it led to two direct -to video sequels most movies don't even get that so no. somebody saw something in the franchise in the movie to be like hey we could there's still something more we could do with this even if it was on a much lesser scale and so there's got to be something out there somewhere down the road for this to be able to come back and really add to Sam's legacy, especially if he's involved. So I would love to see it. Something like this, I think it would be great on, say, like HBO Max. I think that's the place that would really give it the the chance to breathe and become something yeah. special. Anywhere else, I, I don't know. But even if we never see anything, there's this first movie is amazing. There's certainly a place for it in anybody's collection. If you like your darker superheroes that doesn't have any connection to, a, this is an original superhero and Sam did a fantastic job. Liam was fantastic. Overall, the movie is, I'd give it probably a very solid eight and a half to nine out of 10. Yeah, what would you give it, I, Kevin? Oh, golly. Um, eight and a half. I'd say eight and a half. Um, whereas I'm not necessarily bothered by the blue screening. I do agree with you on that. And, and I wouldn't have minded seeing it go a little bit longer. There was a lot of sincerity and realism to this movie that there was more to tell. Like you said, with, with HBO max, it needed more room to breathe it talked about having uh how much time was it for this his facial reconstruction to complete 99 minutes oh you yeah. had oh the actual reconstruction of his face yeah <laughs> which i could do in photoshop in like seconds now it was <laughs> 23 days 19 hours and 57 minutes well he was using computers from 1989 that's true. That's true. And that was again. My phone could render that purpose. shit in less time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, but so yeah, like it there's like a five or not even a five minute montage, a two and a half minute montage that skips twenty three days. So there was a lot that could have happened in this movie that they could have shown. There's a lot of stalking of Durant's guys that he could yeah. have done more uh, blending in and stuff like that and when he does blend in with the masks and the gloves and stuff they do this neat thing where the actor will move their face just every once just in a while farting yeah. around yeah but there'll be a rubber sound like someone like pulling latex squish. gloves yeah and it's so cool it's just a nice little touch yep i'm certain the actors enjoyed being able to play different roles like that and that's a good way to work around like special effects work. Just save it for when you need to take the mask off or this, that, or the other, 
or you needed to start burbling. I mean, I don't know. That, that was just a nice added concept to this. I almost would have felt like when they did 99 minutes for the mask, maybe you could have kept the movie to 99 minutes in general. Because as it is, <laughs> this is a 96 minute movie. Yeah, man. Three more minutes, Sam. Actually, I can't even blame Sam. Universal is the one that does that. Yeah, Universal. Give us back our three minutes of deleted scenes. Psh, bastards. Psh. Now, did you say this is supposed to be getting a 4K release? Um, I don't remember that. It might be. I wouldn't be surprised. I oh, no, it is. There's a steelbook coming out tomorrow. Well, far I'm out. We'll click on that super quick just to be on the safe side. But uh, yes, I am heading over to Blu-ray.com. <laughs> and I'm going to look for Dark Man 4K. Came out on February 20th, actually. So it's already been out for a few weeks now. Cool. I thought I didn't think it, it was out yet, but I guess it's already out. I just I'm I don't know about getting a 4K to be honest with you. I'm perfectly happy with my Blu-ray, so I dig it. I mean watching the DVD is fine for me. I've never seen it any other way. But yeah. taking the screenshots, I'm kind of like, mm, I know I could probably get a much crisper shot. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, again, the leg gun here. Part of it looks so clear, and then the rest of it's all fucked up and unfocused. So. Yeah. Speaking of fucked up and unfocused, the sex scene in this movie was off-putting. It didn't happen. I had to make it better. <laughs> like, it shows him starting to undo her, her clothes before it cuts very quickly and kindly. And all I could think of is like making shadow puppets up on the screen. Little wangs. Anyway. I'm a child. Shut up. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> All right, Kevin, you got any final screenshots before we say goodbye to everybody? No, no. Their horrid sex scene was the last thing I wanted to show everyone. All right, NC-17, y'all. That's for everybody out there. If you like what you saw in this video, hit the like button. Comment down below. You got any favorite memories of Dark Man? You have it in your collection? Favorite characters? Any quotes? Anything like that? Please put those little comments down below. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification button. We want you with us. We have soared past 3,000 subscribers. We appreciate everybody for joining us. We are very happy to hit that milestone. We're now working towards getting monetized. So if you watch our video all the way through, thank you so, so much. And we will see you all on the next one because we're going a little crazy for April 1st. We're going a little ghoulish for that one. But then we're going to follow it up with the rest of April being an alien month. So everybody stay tuned for that. We'll see you all next time. Make sure you check us out on all of our social media platforms. We got Facebook, Twitter. We are at Suns and Shadows. We're also on Instagram at Suns and Shadows Cast. We are at SunsandShadows.com. Thank you again, everybody. And we'll see you down the road.